today we're very happy to have uh, uh, Roy to give a talk here. Uh, he's a Fulbright postdoctoral fellow at Tel Aviv University, working with Niv Buckbinder. He received his PhD in algorithms, combinatorics, and optimization uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, where he was advised by Anupam Gupta. Uh, before that, he worked as a research engineer at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, and before that, he received bachelor degrees in math and computer science from Brown University. Uh, Roy's main research interests are algorithms for uncertain environments, online dynamic streaming algorithms, and some module optimization. Um, please welcome our speaker. Uh, thanks for the very nice introduction. Um, so today I'll tell you about um, um, some work that we did. This is kind of a blend of a Fox paper from a couple years ago and some uh, forthcoming results that we have. The title of the talk is Online Covering, Secretaries, Profits, and Universal Maps. Hopefully, I'll tell you what these things mean. And this is joint work with uh, Anupam Gupta and uh, Greg Keeney, who's at Harvard. And Anupam's from CMU. OK. So today, we're going to talk about the set cover problem. What's the set cover problem? I have m sets and n elements. Script s is the sets. Uh, script u is the elements. I'm drawing this bipartite graph to represent the set system. So there's a vertex for every set, a vertex for every element. And there's an edge between a set and an element if the set contains the element. So what's the goal of this problem? It's to pick the smallest number of sets on the left-hand side to cover all the elements, i.e. such that every vertex on the right has uh, some edge to a picked, a picked uh, vertex on the left. So this you know, uh, set of red dots is a feasible set cover solution of size 3. Okay. Classic uh, uh, optimization problem. We know a lot about it. We know that it's uh, hard to solve exactly unless p is equal to np. But you can get uh, pretty decent approximations to the optimal solution. In particular, the greedy algorithm achieves a log n plus 1 approximation, famous, uh, famous result that we teach in, in approximation algorithms courses. Great. So, What's the online version of set cover? It's by now a somewhat uh, a, like classic framework. It was introduced by Alon, Auerbuch, Hazal, Buchbinder, and Nao in, uh, in 2003. So it's, it's about 20 years old now. Um, it's the same problem, only now we don't know the right-hand side of this graph ahead of time, and it's going to be shown to us online. And the model is that uh, at every point in time, a vertex is going to show up. Okay, And as soon as a vertex shows up, we have to immediately pick some set on the left to cover the element. OK, so for example, you might pick S1 to cover this incoming element, V1. At time 2, an element V2 shows up. And it's not already covered, so you need to pick some set to cover V2, and so on and so forth. V3 shows up. It's already covered. No need to do anything. And the goal is, by the end of this game, to have picked a total number of sets that is not too much more than the offline optimum if you had full information about the future and infinite computing power. So are the rules of this game clear to everybody? Great. So uh, what can you do in, in this setting? It's, uh, it's not as easy as the, the offline uh, uh, problem. So you can't quite get the log n approximation that we talked about, but you can get close. You can get a double log, log n times log m. n is the number of elements, and m is the number of sets. And it's uh, in this beautiful paper by, by Alain Adal, And it turns out that this result is tight. You can't do better, at least for polytime algorithms. Right. So the motivating question behind our work is, uh, well, you know, this is this is well and good, but the the model here is very pessimistic. Like we're assuming that the adversary is really out to get us in in this setting. And are there reasonable ways to relax the adversary and go beyond the worst case and uh, bypass this double log? So let me give you two uh, reasonable models of how you might do this. One relaxation is the random order. Model. Okay, so in this model, I'll assume that the adversary ahead of time fixes this adjacency uh, uh, structure, and then, but it's unknown to us, so it hides the right-hand side of the graph, but it's it's fixed ahead of time, and now the adversary is forced to roll some dice and then reveal the right-hand side in uniformly random order. So here's how this might go: uh, you know, v1 shows up first, and and so on and so forth, so and we we play the same online set cover game only in uniform random order. Okay, this is one one model. Here's a different relaxation. So, so in the last one, the order was random. You might wonder, is there a way to make the, the instance itself random? So perhaps the order is now still fixed and adversarial, but, but somehow uh, 
the, the structure of the graph itself is, is generated randomly. And here's a reasonable way to do this. I have distributions d1 through dn, and the vertices that I see are drawn successively from these distributions. So v1 is drawn from d1, uh, and we play online to cover now with, with these vertices, vv2 from d2, and so on and so forth. Any questions? Great. So what's known about these models? Um, let's draw a table. So in the, on the x-axis is whether or not the instance is random or adversarial. And on the y-axis is whether the arrival order is random or adversarial. So what we said before is that if both are adversarial, log n times log m is the right, right answer. OK. In the top left corner, there's this very nice paper by Anupam and some co-authors, uh, Grandoni, Lunardi, Miettinen, and Senkowski, and, and Singh, and a stock paper in 08 that showed that uh, uh, at least, okay, so actually this paper is only for the, the identical distribution case, so all the Ds are the same. But they showed that you can get log m times the support size of the distribution that you're sampling from. Does this make sense? OK. What about these other two boxes? What was known? Actually, nothing. And uh, oh, OK, good. So, so this box I'm going to call the secretary box in analogy with the classic maximization problem. Uh, you know, the max finding problem in, in random order is called the secretary problem. And this box I'm calling the profit box. Again, an analogy with the classic maximization problem. If you don't know what these are, it doesn't matter. They're just names. But uh, if you do, hopefully, these, uh, these connections make sense. And there was some very good reason to, to believe that you can't beat log n times log m. And I think this is why these, these kind of evaded uh, uh, you know, um, characterization for so long. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what these reasons are. But actually, what we show is that there is a polytime algorithm for the secretary uh, covering IP problem, which is even more general than, than set cover. But for this talk, we'll just talk about set cover. With competitive ratio log of mn, and the m and the n are both inside the same log. So this is a twofold kind of improvement over the top left corner. Uh, um, it's kind of like sampling from a, a, uh, an identical distribution, only the distribution is unknown. So in the top left, you really need to know the distribution. And second, we improve the support size term to n, only the number of elements that you actually sample, which could be exponentially smaller. So the support size term could, in principle, be as big as 2 to the m. Two, yeah, where m is the number of sets. And at least in the regime where m is poly n, this is the best possible, you know, you're achieving the offline bound, basically, for, for that regime. OK, and it's, it's a new algorithm. It's not just a new analysis of an old algorithm. In some sense, what we're doing is showing that you can learn this unknown distribution and solve the underlying combinatorial problem at the same time. OK, and the, the new result is that actually we can get the same thing for the profit setting. And this is forthcoming work. Um, now, this, uh, these, these algorithms actually have some, some bonus features. So uh, actually, you know, I, I said it works in this profit setting, and you do need to know these distributions, d1 through dn. But actually, you don't really need to know the full distributions. All you need is a single sample from each of the distributions. So there's, there's lots of prior work on, on single sample or small sample profit inequalities. And sort of we can get an analog for this covering minimization setting. And the second thing is that our algorithm happens to be what's called universal. So it builds a universal map. And I'll say, uh, if I have time at the end of the talk, I'll say what that means. Um, and in doing so, it gives a sample complexity bound for building universal maps for covering integer programs. Um, good. Uh, uh, as a bonus, this algorithm random order is also a streaming algorithm with order m space. And it's, as far as we know, the first such algorithm for the set cover problem. OK, um, I'll just give one slide on what the more general formulation is, and then we'll not talk about it again, but just, just so you know. So a covering IP is, a, is, a linear, is a, an integer program of the form minimize C transpose uh, x, subject to these constraints, a i uh, uh, dot x is, is bigger than 1, and the a vectors are all positive. OK, so in the online version, you don't know the constraints ahead of time. They're shown to you one by one. 
And your goal is to maintain a feasible solution to this program where x is only allowed to ever increase monotonically. So as soon as I decide to increase a coordinate to maintain feasibility, I'm not allowed to, to lower it afterwards. And set cover is nothing but the special case where this matrix is, is 0, 1. OK, any questions thus far before I jump in? OK, great. So the structure of the talk is like this. So I'll spend most of the time um, talking about the, the random order or the secretary model, that kind of the, the meat. And then um, actually it turns out that the profit solution, like the profit problem reduces to the secretary uh, version. So I'll, I'll spend a few minutes afterwards. That should be enough, hopefully, to give you a sense of how the profit result goes. OK, let's jump in. So we want to solve this, this uh, random order online set cover problem. The first thing to do is to understand how you might solve set cover if you had full information offline. There's a million and one ways to do this. Here's one that's particularly convenient, and we teach this in, in approximation algorithms courses. So it's a two-stage algorithm. We solve an LP, and then we round the LP. Here's an LP for set cover. There's a variable for every set, xs. We're minimizing the fractional number of sets that we're buying, subject to the constraint that for every element, you need to fractionally pick at least one set to cover that element, and everything should be positive. OK, we know how to solve LPs. This is a relaxation to the true integer problem we're solving. So the, the value of the LP is less than the value of oct. Cool. Second thing to do is we'll, we need to round this to a legit combinatorial solution. And the natural way to do this is to pretend that xs is the probability that you're going to sample the set s. And you just, you just do this. You sample every set with probability equal to its LP value. Now, this is great. The expected cost is the value of the LP, right? Only you're not guaranteed to cover every element with, with high probability. What you can show is that you're covering every element with a constant probability. And so if you boost the number of times you do the sampling by log n, you increase this constant to a, to a high probability, and you can union bound over the elements and say that you're feasible with high probability, OK? So you know, blitzing through this, this classic algorithm gives a, uh, uh, has cost opt times log n from the, the union bound. OK, great. How do you do this online? And how does the Alona Dahl algorithm work? It just does the same two stages but online. We just add the word online in, in orange. OK? So how do we do this? Uh, we write the same LP for set cover. And the, the core of their work and the beautiful thing that they did was they showed that what you can do is you can maintain a solution to this LP as the constraints are arriving online. So recall the elements are arriving, and we need to cover them. This corresponds to elements, to, excuse me, to constraints in the LP arriving over time. And what they can show is you can maintain a solution, a fractional solution to this LP that has two properties. One, it's only ever going to increase monotonically. And second is that it's always within a log m factor of the optimal solution of the LP at that point in time. Now, why is this so powerful? Because it allows you to round online. So if, if my solution at time t looks like this, at time t plus 1, it can only look like this. It can only grow in every coordinate. And what I can do is I can, instead of sampling you know, with respect to, to the you know, xs, I can sample at every round with respect to just the change. And if you do this cleverly, if you set that proportionality constant right, you can analyze this as if you're doing offline rounding, like at the end of the whole like online stream. Okay. The details don't matter too much. It's very simple. But uh, you know, the, the punchline here is that you can do this two-stage analysis. Solve an LP, this time with a loss of log m, and then do the same, the same rounding and lose a log n. OK, so this gives an expected cost now of log n times log m. And this is our benchmark. This is the thing to beat. Any questions so far? Wonderful. So the first thing you want to do is, is like understand if we can just improve the analysis of the Alona Dahl algorithm in random order. And I'm going to tell you that, no, you can't. OK, so first of all, the analysis is, is tight. OK, so independent rounding. If you're analyzing independent rounding, you can't hope to prove anything better than log n loss in, in, in isolation Okay, in this step of the analysis. And what we show is that actually log m is a lower bound for fractional algorithms, even in random order, which means that the two stages of this analysis are tight. You can't maintain a fractional solution without losing log m, and you can't round a fractional solution without losing log n. 
this is not just an analysis artifact. There are actually instances on which the alone et al algorithm gets this double log loss. So it's, it's actually like an algorithmic problem. And a new algorithm is needed. OK? Uh, in some sense, what I'm about to show you is a way to maintain a something that looks kind of like an LP solution, except it's a coarse solution. It's not a legit feasible solution, nor is it monotone. And yet, you can get away with rounding this thing over time and, and get the bound that I'm claiming. This might look a little mysterious, but hopefully I'll elucidate in a few slides. OK, great. Any questions? We're about to dive into the algorithm. OK, the algorithm is called learn or cover. And I'm going to start with an exponential time warm-up version that's very intuitive. And I hope that the name makes sense. OK, so we're in the unit cost setting. Sets always cost one. And this is the exponential time warm-up. Here's how the algorithm works. In our heads, there's two objects. There's the universe, this world, which is initialized to be all the elements that you're going to see. This is an unknown object, but it's floating around. OK, we do, you know, the algorithm doesn't know this world. And the second thing I'm calling script P, or the portfolio, of everything that could be the optimal solution. So using standard tricks and online algorithms, I can assume I know K, the size of opt. And I'll initialize my portfolio to be every K tuple of sets. So initially, I don't know anything. Sorry. I don't know anything. Any K tuple of sets could be the optimal solution a priori. And I just enumerate all such solutions. It's a big set. Here's the algorithm. At time t, an element v arrives. If it's covered, do nothing. Right? Why, why buy anything? Otherwise, we'll do two things. We'll choose a t uniformly at random from p. And the second thing we'll do is buy a random r from, from that t. So let's do this carefully. The type of p, right? p is this portfolio. It's all k tuples of sets initially. So if I sample a t from p, that's a single k tuple some candidate thing that could be the optimal solution. And then from this T, I'm going to buy a single R. So the type of R is a legit set. I'm buying a single set in this blue one. That's step one. Step two is we prune this portfolio. OK, any P that doesn't cover the incoming element will toss out. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, trying to maintain the invariant. Like this, this portfolio, I want to think of as everything that could be the optimal solution. I know the optimal solution is feasible. It covers all the elements. So if any of these k tuples don't cover the incoming element, we'll throw it out, because we know it's not the optimal solution. Does this algorithm make sense? Sorry, clarifying question. Um, if you are pruning after you choose the random set r, it may not actually cover v, right? Like Great r question. May... Yeah, that was my, like, I have this, like, uh, test the audience thing lined up. You, yeah. So you're right. We might not cover the incoming element, so we'll do this extra backup step. Like nothing we did kind of guaranteed that we're coming the incoming element. We're just sampling from some distribution that's induced by this portfolio, and then we're updating the portfolio. So we'll also just buy an arbitrary set to cover the element. OK. OK, and this is truly the algorithm. Does the algorithm make sense? OK, so to analyze this thing, uh, when v arrives covered, we pay 0. When v arrives uncovered, we pay 2, one for this r that we're sampling, and one for this backup set that we're, we're buying if, if v is uncovered. OK, so we just need to count the number of times we land in the else clause. And here's how we'll do it. Case 1, most of my portfolio is decent. OK, at least half of the p in my portfolio, these k tuples cover at least half of the remaining universe. I'm thinking of you here as the remaining universe and throwing out anything that's not, uh, uh, that, that's been covered already. OK, so if, so, OK, at least half of p cover at least half of u, then this means that in some intuitively, like the sampling should work pretty well. So let's, let's formalize this. So, the R that we sample, I claim, covers 1 over 4K of the remaining U in expectation. Why? So if half of P cover at least half of U, the T that I sample should cover like a quarter of U in expectation. And T is a K tuple. So if I pick a random one of this K tuple, I cover like 1 over 4K in expectation, which means that U is going to shrink multiplicatively by 1 minus 1 over 4K. OK, 
That's case one. Case two, at least half of my P covered less than half of the remaining universe U. So I should think of this as most of my portfolio is bad. And intuitively, I should make progress pruning. Like if most of my portfolio is bad, I should be able to throw out a lot of my candidate solutions with high probability. So I claim that at least half of the P in my portfolio are pruned with probability 1 half. And why is this? It's because we're sampling, you know, uh, the elements are coming in uniform random order. So condition on landing in this else clause, an element arrives uncovered, it's as if I've sampled uniformly from the uncovered portion of the space. And if I've sampled uniformly from the uncovered portion of the space, then half of the Ps have a probability one half of being pruned, which means my portfolio is shrinking by three quarters in expectation, multiplicatively. That's it, we're done. Why is this? Oh, sorry. So the picture you should have in your head is we don't know which case we're in. We can't evaluate which case we're in as the algorithm, but we're either in case one or case two. And in case one, we take a bite out of U, and in case two, we take a bite out of P. So we're marching along and kind of taking a bite out of one or the other as this goes along. So why are we done? So we said in case one, U shrinks by one minus one over four K in expectation. Case two, P shrinks by three quarters in expectation. The size of U is initially N, right? That's the number of elements we need to cover. So after K log N of these cover steps, that's case, case one steps, we're done. We've covered everything. The size of P is initially M choose K, which is like M to the K. So after K log M of these learn steps where you prune a lot, you're also done because you've uniquely identified the optimal solution. OK, so that means that after K log M plus K log N steps, you've necessarily done one or the other, and you've, you've either covered everything or learned the optimal solution. And that's it. K was, our, was opt, right? Any questions? OK, great. Um, let me write this proof in a slightly different way that's convenient for later. It's the exact same proof, but with, with this uh, uh, slightly different notation. I can write a potential function to capture what I just said. The potential function phi uh, here is 1 over k log size of p, so some scaling of, of the log of the size of p plus log of the size of u. Right? I'm getting like a multiplicative decrease in one or the other, so this means I should get like kind of an additive decrease overall in this potential. And right, we said like in, in case, OK, so this potential starts at log mn. You can, you can kind of see this, right? The portfolio is initially size m to the k. So log of that, right, is, is, is k log m divided by k, right? And then log u is, is, is log n. It never goes below 0. And uh, these, you know, this case, two, case 1, case 2 argument that I just gave you basically argues that uh, in expectation, this thing decreases by 1 over k additively in expectation. OK, so if the initial potential is log mn, in every step where I pay 2, it goes down by 1 over k. My total cost is k log mn. All right. So that was an exponential time algorithm. In particular, we had to enumerate all possible solutions. The next obvious question is, how do you make this poly time? Is there a way to reuse the learner cover intuition? And this is our next goal. So. Why did we need exponential time? It was to, to enumerate this portfolio and at the end to generate a distribution over sets, right? So what we're doing is, is in the algorithm is we're um, generating a distribution over sets and then sampling from the distribution and trading these two things off. So maybe we should just directly maintain a distribution instead of going through the, the enumeration. And that's exactly what we'll do. All right, so here's learner cover, the, the algorithm for the unit cost case. I'll initialize the distribution over sets to be the uniform distribution. This is the, the analog of, of uh, initializing a portfolio to be like the enumeration of all possible solutions. Okay, I don't know anything. I should treat every set equally. This makes sense. An element arrives at time t. Anyone want to guess what the first step is? OK, if it's covered, do nothing. Yeah, OK. If it's uncovered, we'll do something very similar to before. One is we'll sample from the distribution. And the second thing we'll do is we'll update the distribution in some way. 
And the way we'll do it is we'll give a multiplicative boost to every set covering the incoming element. The incoming element give us some information that the sets covering it, you should kind of, you know, probably buy them in the future. So let's give those an, an upweight a little bit. What we'll do is every set containing the element will multiply by a constant. For convenience, I've written e. This is the number, you know, the constant e. And then we'll renormalize to make sure it's still a distribution. Then as, as Guru pointed out, we still need to make sure this, the element is covered, so we'll do the same backup step. OK, this is the, this is the, uh, the new algorithm. And we can analyze it with a, a potential function. That's a, a kind of modified uh, version of, of what I showed you before. And here is the potential function. It's some weighted sum of the KL divergence between the optimal solution and our current distribution at time t. When I say uh, optimal solution, I really mean the uniform distribution over the optimal solution. So the optimal integral solution you know, is, is a 0, 1 vector. And then I'm going to normalize it to make sure it's a distribution, just so that these things are on the same scale, plus log of the number of, of uh, uncovered elements. That part of the potential is the same. And if you forget what KL divergence is, this is, this is what it is. It doesn't matter too much. We're not going to get into the innards. But the point is that you know I've color coded things suggestively. The red part is measuring how much you've learned about the optimal solution, and the blue part's measuring how much progress you've made covering. And this potential function is measuring your kind of joint progress doing both of these things. Okay, same proof template as before. This potential is loaded up with log m n. It doesn't go below zero, and the the meat of the proof is to show that when an element arrives uncovered, this potential goes down in expectation by one over k which means I'll pay a constant k log mn times, which gives the bound. OK. Um, what's cool about this proof is that the, the blue part, you can kind of bound these things very separately. You can bound the decrease in the blue part over the randomness of r, and you can bound the decrease in the red part over the randomness of v. And this is important because we know there's a lower bound of a double log in the adversarial order setting, so you better be using random order or somewhere, and this is exactly where we're using it. You have to say, like, the potential you know, only goes down uh, in expectation if you sample the next element in random order. Um, OK, I'm going to sketch the, the proof. We're not going to do the math. Um, claim 2a and 2b are that the red part goes down by this, the blue part goes down by this. Um, doesn't matter what these things mean, except that the red part has a positive term and a negative term, and the blue part has a negative term. And the positive part of the red term looks like the negative part of the blue term. And so if you weight things appropriately, you get just the negative part of the red term. OK, so these things fit into each other nicely like uh, puzzle pieces, and you get the thing that I claimed. OK, and uh, again, so the initial potential is log mn. The total cost is k log mn here. Order, order of, yeah. And I'm going to flash some math at you just to show you it fits on one page. <laughs> so I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just not a very hard calculation once you've set everything up nicely um, of these two facts. It fits on, fits on the slide. And really, the only thing we're using is these like uh, you know, exponential approximations. I should say these proofs look very similar to like regret bounds for multiplicative weights. Um, and yet we don't know, like we tried quite hard to like reduce our problem in any way to, to the standard multiplicative weights analysis. Not clear how you do this. In particular, it's not clear where you'd exploit the random order. And it's really crucial for our analysis. Any questions? We're going to end the talk too soon if you guys don't ask questions. So, But it's good to go slow and like, uh, yeah. Um, that's it. OK, let me give you some like floofy high level philosophy. Um, so, um, We'd really like to understand the connection and the, the contrast between this and the, the Alon et al algorithm for the adversarial order case. And there's this very nice view of that algorithm. It's kind of a more modern view. That's, uh, if, if you want to read about it, it's in this uh, uh, 2019, I think it's a soda paper uh, by Anupam and, and, and uh, friends. And what it says is that that algorithm you can think of as follows. At time t, you're in some uh, feasible region. Let's say it's this polytope. And at time t plus 1, you get a constraint that you're not satisfying. And their algorithm, basically, what it's doing is it's projecting in KL divergence onto this feasible region. 
Okay, it's finding the point in the feasible region that's closest in KL divergence to where you used to be. That's that's a view of this algorithm. And it happens to be so. This is for the fractional solution, and it's magically like a monotone solution when you do this, which is which is beautiful and, and amazing. What are we doing? We're doing something similar, but not quite. So we're living on the constraint cost of our solution equals cost of opt. In, in saying that our solution is always a distribution, and remember I normalized opt to be a distribution, we're essentially like, it's where we can think of ourselves as living on that, uh, on that uh, subspace. And we're not going to do a full projection when we see a new constraint, but we are going to do a partial projection. So the, the multi multiplying by E is in fact like a partial version of that same projection that Alon et al. do. But then we project back down to this, this constraint from before. So these are kind of two, two you know, geometric views of the old and, and new algorithm that are suggestively similar, but also very different. OK, second uh, perspective is that in some sense, we are running stochastic gradient descent. And I'd love to understand this better. I wish I understood this like better if anybody uh, uh, wants to, to unpack this and, and like figure out the, some like deep unified theory. I think this, this would be a really important goal. But let's define this function, f of x. x is our, is our fractional solution. And this thing is the sum over the vertices, over, excuse me, sum over the elements of the max of 0 and 1 minus the fractional set mass that covers that element. So this is, think of this as like total fractional uncoverage, the uncovered you know, mass in, in all of the elements. We want to minimize this function. We want to find an x that, that sets, makes this 0. There's no uncoverage, right? And suppose I'm in this model where like every time I query a new point, I pay one. Then really what we're asking is like, you know, find me the minimum in the smallest number of steps. It sounds like you should run like a gradient descent. This is a convex function, whatever. What is the gradient of this function? You can, you can think about this for, for uh, two seconds if, if, you know, if you had uh, uh, offline. And you'd see that it's just the number of, so this, this gradient is indexed by sets. That's, that's its type. And the gradient at a set is the number of uncovered elements in that set, which is proportional to the indicator of whether an element uh, is, is in that set if it's sampled like, like, uh, uniformly from the uncovered portion of the space. So what is our algorithm doing? It's just taking sets and multiplying them, like excess, multiplying it by e to the indicator, to this same indicator at every point in time. So in some sense, the random order is exactly revealing a stochastic gradient, and our algorithm is exactly running SGD with the stochastic gradient. Of course, it's like it's really like a mirror descent with entropy mirror map, but, but this is sort of the, the high-level view of this thing. Whoa, sorry. Any questions about these things? Somehow the, the crucial difference is in the rounding, like something that's not captured by, by stochastic gradient descent analyses is like how the rounding magically kind of uh, mixes with this, uh, you know, minimizing this, this, this uh, function continuously. So. so sort of a slightly different question, which is that if you go back to your original intuition of like learner cover with the exponential size sets, um, I guess the bad case in some sense was where every time you draw, at least um, if it comes up, if it doesn't come up with random order, you're not necessarily pruning your size um, well enough. Is this intuition, like, could you use this idea somehow when you have recourse? Supposing it was adversarial, but if you're giving me a set, a sequence in sort of a bad order, I can go back and choose something that would have actually made it better. Is that, I don't even know if this question is well studied or like. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so I've studied like low recourse set cover mm -hmm. in, in like adversarially ordered like insertion and deletion streams. Mm -hmm. But it, it'd be very interesting if you could somehow quantify like, like if you know distance, if you're not fully uniformly random, can you save, you know, save yourself with a little bit of recourse? And what's the trade-off between the distance from uniformity and? Right. Yeah, no, I, I haven't thought about this. Um, that's a great question. Okay. We are. 
actively thinking about how you can relax the random order. I and I can tell you one thing is that, um, OK, so you know, there's different ways in which you could imagine relaxing the assumption that everything comes in uniformly random order. One is I could say, what's the entropy of the ordering distribution? Mm -hmm. And there's very simple examples with entropy. So, so okay, there's n factorial distributions. The entropy of this is roughly uh, n log n. Mm -hmm. I can create distributions with entropy 1 minus epsilon n log n, so almost completely full entropy. So they look almost uniformly random in this entropy parameterization, right. but you lose this double log. Like, you, there's just nothing. I so that's not a good parameterization. Mm -hmm. But I'm very interested in like other parameterizations of like how far off you are from uniform. And you know, you could ask the first question is just like, how well does this algorithm do based on the distance from uniformity? And what you're asking, I guess, is like, if I have recourse, and that like, can I quantify the recourse I need to to get mm -hmm. back? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, I think we're good on time. Okay. That's it. So let me spend a few minutes telling you about the profit version. So let's recall what the profit setting is. And we're in the single sample profit setting. OK, so I, uh, I'm going to sample a sequence of elements from a sequence of distributions. And I don't know these distributions ahead of time. But I do have, ahead of time before this game begins, a single sample v hat i from each distribution di. OK. We're going to just do a reduction to learner cover. And here's how it goes. The samples are v1 hat through vn hat. The real draws are v1 through vn. The algorithm is this. We're going to run learner cover on v1 hat through vn hat. And then at time t, um, uh, if a real element vt arrives, uh, if it's covered, we'll do nothing. And otherwise, we'll just buy an arbitrary set to cover vt. This is the entire algorithm. Does this make sense? Any questions? So we're just literally like running learner cover on our samples. Then if anything slips through the cracks, just like do anything arbitrary to, to save it. OK, so how does this analysis go? I claim that running learner cover on the first part is we can pay for that. And why is this? It's because the v1s, the, the v's and the v hats are drawn from the same distribution. So you can analyze it as if you're running learner cover on the true the true samples. Okay, and we by the learner cover analysis, that's log mn times opt. So that part's fine. The thing to analyze is like why why are the backup sets in this in this reduction? Why can we pay for them? And I claim that the cost of back of like paying for backup for vi is only less than the cost of paying for backup of v hat i. Where the backup for v hat, I mean like during the learner cover. Like the learner cover also does this backup step. And the way to see that is that imagine we've ordered the pairs in random order. What's learner cover doing? It's like marching through these pairs, uh, marching through, you know, just the, the hats. And what I'm, what I'm, uh, the thought experiment that I want you to consider is what's, what's the odds, what's the probability that v1 is uncovered? at the point in time in which learner cover hits v1 hat. Well, v1 and v1 hat are drawn from the same distribution. And if we defer the randomness to like when, you know, when we see that, that pair, the, like the one index, defer the randomness of actually drawing v1 and v1 hat to that point, the odds that v1 is uncovered when learner cover hits v1 hat are the same. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Are these distributions like you, I mean, for each point, the distribution is just like there are some sets of neighbors, and you choose uh, like among which set you pick. Is that right? Exactly. I should have clarified this. So, so I have like um, element types, which is just an adjacency structure in this graph, and I'm picking an element from a set of types with some probability. That makes sense. And there's no like this could be an exponentially sized distribution. Exactly. Okay. Any questions? Sorry, I should have clarified the, the model better. OK, so yeah, so, 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 so one more time. So we're just, we have these samples. And all I'm, what I'm telling you to do is just run this random order algorithm on the samples. 
And actually, I didn't say this, we're simulating random order. We just we have these samples offline. We'll shuffle them and run learner cover on those samples. Now the real the real game starts. So that was Monday. And then Tuesday, like the real game starts, and you see these real draws. And what I'm claiming to you is that basically most of the things will already be covered. Anybody that's uncovered just do anything arbitrary. It's almost a silly reduction. So the, the pre-processing, like running the learner cover at the beginning, is clearly uh, you can pay for it because we know how to analyze learner cover. And the, the, the samples look just like the real draws. And the hard part is how do you argue that the, the backups don't cost you too much? OK, so, so why, does, why does like paying, like why does the expected cost of backup for, say, V1 not cost too much? It's because like um, the odds that V1 is uncovered at the point in which, like, if, if we're sort of thinking kind of in real time, when learner cover hits V1 hat, these things look like they're from the same distribution. OK? So the expected cost, like, at that point is the same as, as, as uh, for V1 hat. This, it's actually, yeah. Sorry, does this, like, rely on you? I mean, I guess, does this rely on you knowing the order in which they'll arrive? Like, I mean, if. No. If you if you didn't know, like it could have been that V one appears first, and like somehow, like, I mean, I guess that doesn't matter. But I'm trying to see why that doesn't matter. Like, in fact, I mean, the adversary can like adaptively reshuffle uh, the the real draws after you've like done your you run your algorithm on the first half. Like the ordering of the real draws doesn't even matter here, because actually we're seeing the real draws after we've run learner cover to completion. But it's just for analysis, I'm thinking of like what's the odds that it's uncovered if, if I see it in the same order as learner cover. Okay. I don't know if I answered your question, but like I'm just trying to like, is there a I'm not seeing why that's sort of a without loss of generality assumption. Like, is there a reason? Like, is it just because you're doing everything in expectation and it doesn't matter? Like so so okay, so so we don't get to reorder the real draws. But suppose we did, and I ordered them in the same order, I coupled them with the, the learner cover ordering. Then I'm saying, like, as you march along in this order, the odds that you're uncovered at that point is the same. But okay. actually, like, the I odds that, that you hit this else clause, it's like right. it's it's only if you're uncovered by the end of learner cover, which it can only sort of help you to run this thing to completion. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah. This, that's it. So that's that's the entire uh, thing. Basically, we charge the backups to the backups of learner cover, which we know we can pay for. So it's a very simple reduction, but it's a little bit like, like uh, tricky. Like I, yeah, it's very confusing and like. Uh, so I, yeah, I think okay. I think so. Does this um, do you lose a fact like if the weights like I guess it doesn't matter, or do you lose some like ratio of the weights or something like that? If the no, so everything generalized to the weighted setting, with uh, the the kind of best possible bounds, you lose a factor of two here. Um, but yeah, constant, just constants. In fact, this generalizes to settings where you have like less than one sample per distribution. Nice. Um, so you know, if I have some odds of like you know an erasure, like some some sample is just deleted, this still works. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is basically the like all I wanted to say. Um, this is almost the end of the talk. Um, uh, let me give uh, yeah good so so we paid for that part, um, and we're happy yeah didn't say that okay so um, let me say like one slide on on universality and then we can like wrap up and I'll I'll order, open the floor to questions what do I mean by universality I'll I'll explain it in terms of our algorithm so it turns out that our algorithm you can think of as doing the following it builds a map from elements to sets after only seeing the the hats the samples. Okay, so and um, when a real draw shows up, the algorithm has pre-committed in a very like oblivious, non-adaptive fashion to buying whatever that element maps to. So what is this map? It's like I ran learner cover, right? And then everything else that's up to the cracks, I bought something arbitrary for. So I do need to know the, su the support of these distributions ahead of time, just the support or like some meta universe where elements could be drawn from so that I can build this map. Just so the elements that slip through the cracks, so I can just map them to some set that covers them. But as long as I can do this, I can build this map, right? During the sample phase, um, 
during the sample phase, I uh, uh, um, like I, I ran learner cover, and anybody that's covered in the real draws, I map to you know whoever covered it in learner cover, and then anybody else, I, I do anything arbitrary. And then that's it. I'm just committing like a priori to, to buying things from this map. Um, so that's what a, that's what a universal map is. And uh, what we show is, you know, you only need n samples basically to build this map. This is a sample complexity bound for building universal maps. And previously, it was only known how to do this with full knowledge of the distributions, um, and only for the IID case. So it's that paper in the top left corner of that of that uh, table that I showed you. So that's it. That's all I really wanted to say. Um, the punchline is that learner cover, like we think, is something kind of like powerful and hopefully universal. It solves like a bunch of problems in these like relaxed uh, relaxed settings. So I told you about um, the secretary model, the random order model. It's also a streaming algorithm. You might have noticed, like it does one pass through the elements and it has low space. Uh, it works for this profit setting. Everything works for for covering IPs. Its single sample is universal. We can make it work for non-metric facility location. Um, sometimes there is kind of a crank you can turn to go from set cover to non-metric facility location, and it breaks here. So there are new ideas that that go into this, but but you can do it. Um, it same results for a, with a sample variant where I like I playing online set cover, but I get a pre-sample sum of my input. It works for some for like a two-stage variant where I can like on Monday buy sets for a discount, and on Tuesday things are more expensive. Um, please ask me offline if you're interested in any of these. And there's there's a bunch of open questions. So I really like to know if, you know, have we really discovered something like interesting? Does it generalize to any other problems? In particular, like there's a hierarchy of, of covering problems that you could try to study that that are harder and harder. And we know that this does like um, end at some point. So for a problem called submodular cover, we have a lower bound that has two logs in it. And I want to know like where in this hierarchy does does that like uh, shift from from uh, single log to double log happen. In particular, I don't know how to answer the question for covering IPs with box constraints, or also known as multiplicity constraints. There are standard tricks for dealing with, with box constraints in every other setting that I know, and they all break in random order for like uh, yeah important reasons. So if, if anyone is interested, this is a, like a problem that I really want to solve. Um, yeah, that's it. Like, if anyone can figure out a unified theory uh, uh, of 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 what we've done here, um, you know, one thing I want to know is: can we reinterpret old uh, random order results in this learner cover framework? That's also something I'd be very interested in. Um, that's it. Thanks for your time, and I'll answer questions. And I'm I'm around uh, Google New York for like a, a short time if uh, if anyone's interested in, in chatting for a couple of weeks. So I had a quick question building off of one of the things Guru asked, uh, which is you know, somehow I just have this hand wavy vague intuition that like this seems incredibly strong and that seems to be due to caring about expectations. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to think, and I don't see how to do this. And I'm wondering if, if there is anything you can say or if it just doesn't even make sense. Like, suppose I let you take lots of samples, right? Like, sure, you, in expectation, you can do things with one sample each. But I say, mm -hmm. how do I normally go from an expectation to high probability bound is I take a bunch of, of samples, right? And then I use mm -hmm. a, some tail bound or something, right? Is there kind of anything I can say about tail bounds and using multiple samples or just kind of doing something beyond just expectations? Um, that I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. Um, oftentimes, you can't get anything in these online models with high probability, but I'd need to think about it. Um, about like in the profit setting in particular, right? Like yeah. somehow intuitively, I could imagine a distribution that is somehow like high variance, even though it's kind of not a number. It's a bunch yeah. of uh, adjacencies still in some intuitive sense, high variance. Like, how can it possibly be the case that one sample is all you need? It's like, well, okay, because of expectation, right? Yeah. But like, I don't know. It seems like maybe if I took a lot of samples, I could do better. No, that's a good question. I have to think about it. Yeah, offline. Yeah. Thanks. I guess one more technical question. Uh, so 
as someone who has somehow avoided ever actually learning anything about KL divergence, other than the fact that it's asymmetric, uh -huh. does it matter which version, you know, like yeah. you got it in one direction, does it matter which direction it is? Yeah. Only this one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't have a super good uh, explanation, yeah. Cool. But the other one doesn't work. Cool. Thank you so much for, for organizing, yeah.